Hey there everyone, today I'd like to look at the way that James Joyce uses the stream of consciousness technique to help understand perception in the third episode, Proteus of Ulysses. Now anyone who knows anything at all about Joyce knows that he, particularly Ulysses, but also Finnegan's Wake especially, is a particularly difficult author to read. His stuff is filled with allusions and is very elusive, and it's mysterious but also exciting to read because you can spend ages on one sentence, on one paragraph, on one page, on one episode, etc., and it's just really interesting to read this and look at all the different allusions that are being made, but also the overall message that Joyce is trying to deliver in Ulysses. And this runs throughout all of Joyce's work, but it's very pragmatic. Joyce is situated in a moment in which Ireland is trying to gain independence from Britain, at least certain parts of it are, and, you know, there's this notorious Northern Ireland and then the Republic of Ireland, which still exists today in that form. And Joyce is situated in a moment of kind of political strife, but also he's trying to ground human existence and what it means to be human in the everyday. He's trying to look at the way that Normal people live their normal lives. And as such, this is in line with a lot of modernist authors and philosophers who are looking at the downfall of grand narratives. In this way, Joyce is very similar to Friedrich Nietzsche, who's an author that he draws on a lot in Ulysses and one who is very popular in Joyce's time and still today where we're looking at the downfall of these grand idealistic narratives in place of the everyday, the person trying to make it by learning to master their will, learning how to take heed of their situation, how to grapple with the ways that, for example, political power manifests itself. And as such, Joyce is trying to situate his characters in a way that takes account of the most subtle of details, but in a way which isn't framed by a grand narrative. And the main character of this third episode, called Proteus, is Stephen Dedalus, and this is one of the kind of two or three main characters, along, of course, with Leopold Bloom. And Stephen is a teacher, and Stephen is an artist. This is picking up, of course, from Portrait of the Artist, which is one of Joyce's other works. And at one point, Stephen is talking with someone who talks about the idea of something being just. And Stephen says, I fear those big words which make us so unhappy. So there's kind of this, this doubtfulness or this skepticism of the grand narrative of justness, or for example, there's also this kind of talk of the reinvigoration of Ireland and whatnot, bringing back, um, you know, Irish as a language, bringing back Irish culture. Um, if you read The Dead from Dubliners, there's this big talk of, uh, like you being a West Briton, in other words, being an Irish person associated with Britain and kind of British stereotypes is like an insult of sorts to kind of a, a purity culture in Ireland that's trying to get back to Irish roots. And Joyce had a tenuous relationship to Irish nationalism, for example, because, you know, he sympathized with being out from under the authoritarian rule of Britain. And, you know, Britain had influenced the famine in the 1840s in Ireland, which is one of the most catastrophic events in European history. And as such, he's very sympathetic to this, but also considering that Joyce is not so fond of these big words which make us so unhappy, 
He's also a little bit skeptical of this national identity that's grounded in some romantic depiction of Irish life. Joyce doesn't go for a romantic depiction of Irish life. He wants to look at the everyday person undergoing everyday struggles. As Stephen is looking out at these schoolboys playing on a field, he says, again, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies, in a medley, the joust of life. So, right, these jousting bodies of the schoolboys are kind of a microcosm for the world of the everyday person, be they Irish, be they British, be they American, etc. And as such, in the very beginning, and we're just going to look at maybe, you know, a little over two paragraphs of Proteus, Joyce is looking at perception and in a way that's very Heideggerian in a sense, because one of the choices that Heidegger makes when he's looking at phenomenology, you know, this, the study of phenomena, of experience, of perception, Heidegger looks at someone like Hegel, and Hegel, of course, you know, he writes Die Wissenschaft der Logik, the science of logic, or the study of logic, the science is a good word. And he sees Hegel as making a very systematic, very logical, very contemplative, very, you know, speculative in, in kind of the phenomenology sense of speculative idealism, sees him as making a very speculative understanding of perception. And one of Joyce's points in Ulysses is that oftentimes perception doesn't manifest in a logical way. It is in the mode of the everyday or the immediate. And as such, we don't often contemplate things in a logical way, but rather we live them. And we live in the here and now. And there's a sort of disembodiedness which Joyce is going to point to as he enters in this stream of consciousness mode of writing. And this is something that Joyce helped popularize. Of course, he wasn't the originator of the stream of consciousness. But basically how this literary device works is every single thought or perception or temporal moment is taken into account but not in a romantic way where if you look at, for example, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, whose author is anonymous, if you look at something like that, you'll see these lavish romantic portrayals of, you know, the thematic color of greenness or gold, for example, or spending, you know, just paragraphs and paragraphs talking about the furniture. And it's so unnecessary. It's so lavish and immense and it accentuates parts of reality that don't really line up with the human experience you know in an, in one's actual perception of something you don't spend these huge moments just talking about the greenness of something it's just sort of a you know a benign detail that you go beyond and as you're living you perceive these various things and Joyce wants to capture that mode of being, which is everydayness. And one of Heidegger's big points is that Dasein, which is the unique mode of human existence, the thing that is perceiving in the manner that humans perceive, that Dasein parades in the mode of everydayness. Which is to say, Dasein exists in this mode of living the everyday, not always in the contemplative mode, in fact, rarely in the contemplative mode of someone like Hegel. So instead, we get this, you know, this is exemplified in, for example, the blacksmith for Heidegger, or the worker of some kind, the peasant, which is very much in line with Joyce's focusing on Irish peasant life or kind of Irish everyday person life is that when, for example, the blacksmith is working, they don't work in the mode of contemplation, 
but they work in the mode of everydayness. And the things which are ready to hand, things like tools, like hammers, they aren't contemplated, but they're used. And Heidegger points out that rarely do tsug, tools, rarely do they get contemplated unless something goes wrong. Unless the weight is off and somehow it just becomes immediately apparent that there's something wrong with this. There's something not ready to hand about this, and thus I enter the mode of contemplation. And I start to logically think about, oh, how can I specifically adjust the weight of this hammer, for example, to make it fit my needs at this moment? And these needs that are going to be fit by the hammer aren't expressed, of course, usually logically. They're just something you live out. They're something you're always alongside of, which is a big point for Heidegger. In terms of what being is, the question of being or Designsfrage is something that you're always already alongside, tarrying with, and learning how to live in an authentic manner to. So that being said, let's look at these few paragraphs here and figure out how to talk about them after we go through this admittedly very kind of sporadic and just point-and-shoot style of writing. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that, if no more, thought through my eyes. Signatures of all things I am here to read, sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot, snot green, blue silver, rust, colored signs, limits of the diaphane, but, he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them, bodies before of them colored. How? By knocking his sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bald he was in a millionaire, maestro di corcesano. Limit of the diaphane in. Why in? Diaphane, adiaphane. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate, if not a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it, howsoever. I am, a stride at a time, a very short space of time, through very short times of space. Five, six the nach einander. Exactly, and that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No, Jesus, if I could fell over a cliff that beetles o'er his base, fell through the neben einander ineluctably. I'm getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it. They do. My feet in his boots are at the end of his legs, Nibnainanda. Sounds solid, made by the mallet of Los Demiurgos. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick. Rhythm begins, you see. I hear. A catalectic tetrameter of I am's marching. No, a gallop, the line the mare. Open your eyes now. I will. One moment. Has all vanished since? If I open and am forever in the black adiaphane, basta. I will see if I can see. See now. There all the time without you, and ever shall be world without end. So write a very wacky section, and there's a lot going on here. And one of the th important things is that Joyce is taking the time to look at the way perception works in the world. There's these mix of thoughts, of feelings, of affects, all coalescing together in a sort of disembodied perception of the here and now. And two important terms that we ought to keep in mind are nach einander and nebeneinander. These are German terms. 
the former being one after the other, or successively, and the latter being side by side. And this is an allusion to the German dramatist and critic Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. And he's distinguishing between the modes of the visual arts and poetry. And the mode of poetry is visible and progressive. It's different parts occurring one after the other. So this is a an understanding of time where moments are happening one after the other. We're being met with things in succession. But then there's also this sequence of time which is visible and stationary with different parts developing in coexistence. This is Nibbanayananda, side by side, on this singular plane at the same time. So we've got kind of two different conceptions of time, one after the other and side by side. And this has a lot to do with Joyce's understanding of perception here, where he's speaking of colored signs. This is a reference to Bishop Barclay, who's one of the early idealist philosophers, talking about the way that we perceive different things. You know, Joyce mentioned snot green, blue silver, rust, these very specific objects of perception. And Berkeley would say that these are colored signs. This is kind of a, you know, the early manifestation of semiotics or the, the science of signs. The way objects get transported into our perception as an object of perception and get used to understand the world. And for Bishop Barclay's epistemology, we don't see things as they actually are. We see them as an object of perception. We see them as a colored sign which has some relationship. It points to something in the world. And the question, of course, is how do we link between that phenomenological perception, that perception as an object of knowledge, how do we connect that to the objects of the world which we are experiencing? And these are, of course, embodied. That's why he's talking about limits of the diaphane. This is Aristotle that he's alluding to here. And Aristotle mentions, for example, the translucent being an embodied thing, that it subsists in bodies and causes them to partake in color, for example. So there's a sort of embodiedness of perception that, of course, requires an object which is being perceived, the thing that is actually embodying that thing which we are seeing. And as such, how do we become aware of them before becoming aware of them in a logical manner. In other words, how do we live in a mode of perception? How do we perceive things before experiencing them as colored as such, or as having some formal quality? As Joyce says, by knocking our sconce against them. We sort of bump into them in the mode of everydayness, of interacting with things in various ways. And just like we talked about before with the schoolboys, there's just this kind of medley of battling bodies. And the fact that Joyce chose the word medley, by the way, is very significant because, of course, it carries that auditory metaphor of things occurring in the mode of Nibnainanda, side by side, all at once in the mode of the audible. Because you have the modality of the visible, which is ineluctable or inescapable. It is this one after the other perception of one thing after another. And there's always this, you know, worrying of if I open my eyes, is it still all going to be there? Is it going to be the same way? And this leads Stephen to kind of an interesting, you know, he's closing his eyes, he's trying to figure out how to, how to get along, and he has his ash sword, which hangs at his side. And this is a reference to Irish walking sticks, which 
could be made with the wood of an ash tree. And this is also something that the hilts of swords were used, thus the reference to the ash sword. So this ash sword is his walking stick, and it helps him get along even when his eyes are closed. And this is the way we use tools. We don't use it in the mode of, oh, let me logically think about how I'm going to use this tool prior to using it. No, the tool is there to help one get along. And in this mode of Nibnainanda, of affects and perceptions side by side in this modality of the audible, when the visible is foreclosed and his eyes are closed, there's this disembodied thing that you might not have caught. He says, my ash sword hangs at my side, tap with it, they do. My two feet in his boots are at the end of his legs. So he's talking about his own body, but of course, the feet that are in his boots, he's not actually seeing them. So he has to make them an object of his perception. He has to imagine them. He has to think through his eyes. But of course, there are no visible eyes, so now there's only the eyes of perception, which leads to this disembodied relationship to his own feet as being his legs. It's a sort of ambiguous third-person perspective, which is very interesting, because when we get to that moment, see now, there all the time without you, and ever shall be world without end. We're seeing the here and now. We're seeing the event. We're seeing the mode of Nidnainanda, of being immersed in the everyday. And it has this rhythmic quality of I am's marching. That's, you know, that kind of reference there, which is very weird. There's this sort of rhythmic quality to the everyday, which I think is really interesting because that coalesces with all of Joyce's really interesting just literary prowess in terms of the rhythm of his writing. Helps us understand the rhythmic nature of the everyday. And thus, the ineluctable modality of the visible and the audible, the nach einanda and the nib einanda, leave us with an understanding of perception that's really interesting because, you know, we hear the crush, crack, crick, crick of shells because he's walking along a, a, a bay or a seashore. We get this really interesting way of looking at perception that isn't romanticized in the method of, like, the author of Sir Gone of the Green Knight, where we're looking at these very detailed, very idealized understandings of what it's like to see the color green, for example. No, we see these in the method of stream of consciousness, of thoughts going in and out. I mean, Stephen even stutters in his own thoughts later. He's like, and, 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 which is so interesting that Joyce chooses even in his thoughts to make him stutter a little bit. It's all those little details that help us better understand what Heidegger means by Dasein parades in the mode of everydayness. That we live the everyday as the here and now and it can turn into a sort of mystical, disembodied perception when we start to think about these little details in a pragmatic, realistic way. And I think that is the power of this literary device being used in this way to understand the stream of consciousness as one of the most human ways to write. So I hope this has helped you understand a little bit about what Joyce is trying to do in Ulysses Broadly. A very interesting work, very difficult work, one that I would suggest that you start venturing along as I am myself. It's a, it's definitely kind of finding your way in the dark, just like with the ash stick that he spoke of, with the ash weapon. You're trying to find your way through this very difficult narrative, very difficult structure, very allusive and elusive structure. So I hope this has helped just a little bit and linked it to some philosophical themes in phenomenology. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, phenomenology, gender theory, and other literature. 
Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you need help reading some Deleuze and Guattari, or you want to talk about some philosophical problem. It's up to you. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.